Vroom, vroom. <laughs> oh. My name is James. Hey, James. Uh, you're supposed to say your name. I'm, R- <laughs> I'm Riley. God damn it. I'm David. <laughs> and this is the Carpool Critics. Critics. We almost did it. We critique cars. Carpools. Join us on our <laughs> carpool as we discuss, <laughs> what movie is this? 2010's Inception. Womp. Womp. Yeah, the womp that started it all. I thought. I wish I knew that's what you were doing. I, I, I wish you told me beforehand. David, what are you going to give this movie out of ten? I give it a nine point three for its vision, but a six point five for its characters and plot. This you can't which averages split. out to a seven point nine. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for <laughs> amalgamating. Riley, Riley, please do it correctly. Uh, I give it an eight out of ten, and that's all I'm going to say right now. You no know slogan. Oh, oh, you want the slogan? Give me the slogan. Inception. Reality's like not even really real, man. Okay. That's my slogan. For me, when this shit was in trailers, everyone was like, whoa, this movie's gonna be the, the best movie since The Matrix. And then it was. Oh, Nine out of ten. Wow, what a twist. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you like that? It was a slogan within a slogan. Oh. <gasps> <laughs> Sloganception. Roll Syn- the synopsis. Synopsis. Leonardo DiCaprio like plays Dominic Cobb, a professional dream thief hired by corporations to steal information from their competitors' minds, a process called extraction. He's prevented from returning to the U.S. and to his kids by false charges for the murder of his wife, Mal. Cobb is hired by the wealthy Mr. Saito, played by Ken Watanabe, who says he can clear Cobb's name if Cobb can plant an idea in his competitor's mind, a supposedly impossible act known as as Inception. Inception. <gasps> spoiler alert, there's spoilers after this. Spoilers. <laughs> right, yeah, spoilers, obviously. Cobb assembles a team, boards a flight with a target, Robert Fisher, played by Killian Murphy, sedates him, and enters a three-level shared dream within a dream within a dream. Oh my God. In the dream, the team abducts Fisher while fighting off his militarized subconscious projections and learn that due to the strength of the sedative used, dying in the dream will not wake them up like usual, but will send them into limbo, a deep subconscious level where they may be trapped indefinitely and go insane. <laughs> insane. Got no brain. <laughs> the difficulty of the mission is compounded by unpredictable appearances by Cobb's subconscious projection of Maul, played by Marion Cotillard. She appears as a manifestation of the guilt Cobb harbors for her death. It is revealed that prior to the events of the movie, Cobb and Maul were together in limbo for the Dreamtime equivalent of 50 years. And to convince Maul that they needed to return to reality, Cobb performed Inception on her, planting the idea that her <laughs> on <a> reality. First date? <laughs> it's a 50 year first date. Uh, he, p- he planted the idea that her reality wasn't real. So after waking up to the real world, Maul was still convinced she was dreaming and killed herself. During the mission, Saito and Fisher are both killed, sending them to Limbo. Cobb descends into Limbo to save them, but must first face Mal head on. Ultimately, Cobb resolves the traumas of his past. Fisher is incepted with the idea that he should break up his father's business empire, and Saito fulfills his end of the bargain, allowing Cobb to return to his children in America. A neat ending. But perhaps Cobb is still dreaming. Oh... I sure hope not. I think that whole movie's undone if he is still dreaming. I don't think he really is. I don't think so either. I think like, yeah, the top is still spinning when the credits roll, mm. but all signs point to him being awake. You see it begin to wobble. Yeah, well, they have to it, give like, it a little bit. The last few frames, it's it's going. No, but it like flicks over and then stands back up again. Mm. But nobody knows what we're talking about right, right. Now. You have to know that in this movie, there's these things called totems. Yes. And I actually have a real problem with these goddamn totems. Oh, no. I have some issues with these totems. Okay, but first, what is it? So the totem in this movie is a physical object that is supposed to be known only to you. So the idea is like you wake up from one of these wacky dreams that someone designed. Right. And you have an object that only you know about. Like in this uh, movie, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, Arthur, has a loaded die. And mm. he won't let anyone else touch it because he knows the way that it feels in, your, in his hand and everything. So because no one else has touched it, no other like dream designer, architect person could create a dream world that he's in where, where that, dice. that die is identical. Right. So he can wake up, roll the die, and be like, oh yeah, I know this is my die. I'm in the real world. But, well, go, go I, on. Well, what's your butt? Well, I was going to say that the problem with Cobb's totem is that it's a spinning top, right? That originally belonged to Maul, his wife. But... His his deal with that is that he uses it to check whether he's dreaming or in reality, 
but the real regularly totems are supposed to check they're only supposed to check whether you're in someone else's dream yeah that's so weird it works oppositely to all the other totems yeah yeah he doesn't he does get out of the dream and roll and spin it <laughs> right and and but for some reason he says this plot point that you, when you're in a dream if you spin this top it'll spin indefinitely and never topple over but like that has nothing to do with open, someone else knowing that yeah actually he tells somebody that yeah he says it but like the thing that it opens a can of worms because it's like wait a second first of all what do you get to bring into the dream world they never say that you know how in the mm. matrix they're like you know this is residual self-image whoever you think you look like back in the real world that's like why you have hair when you go into the matrix and well, you can load up whatever clothes you want you can be wearing right, a leather right. trench coat in this movie they never say about you your can pa- spawn anything you think of in this movie because he spawns a gun and then tom hardy spawns a rocket launcher that he just pulls out of nowhere grenade so launcher grenade launcher you're right just saying <laughs> so you're able to whatever you think of you're able to bring in it but this movie does not take that concept anywhere. It only does it one time and never brings it up again. Wait, wait, we can get to that. We're going to talk about we that. We can get to that. Because that's okay. annoying to me. So I wasn't clear. I know the scene you're talking about, um, but Tom Hardy just enters the frame with a gun. You don't see it like pop into his hands. It seems like the rules are kind of Looney Tunesy. I wasn't sure if, if the architect, <laughs> the person who designed the dream, had just laid out a table of guns. No. Oh, it, it's meant that... You're he, wrong. I think I am wrong because <laughs> at that point, when Tom Hardy shows up with that... Uh, grenade launcher he says to arthur you mustn't be afraid to dream yeah. a little bigger darling a so great that, line that makes it seem like he used his yeah. imagination yes. to spawn it but then why don't they ever do like incredible things like they're basically the green lantern corp they can imagine anything I know. Like, they can bolt like blow up anything they can do anything there's no rules why are they so constrained to well, what this we is understand? the reason they do they the reason given is that the subconscious mind that's populating this dream of their target starts to get increasingly suspicious when things that aren't normal start happening so if you like suddenly i don't know like hatched a ladder in the middle street and climbed up into heaven or something like that the all the population of that dream all the city folk and everything are manifestations of the subconscious of that target and they'll be like whoa that's not real i must be dreaming and then they'll wake up and they'll foil the whole mission and we see that illustrated when Cobb is training ariadne and he brings her into the dream world and she makes a bunch of changes and then his projections are like hey what the heck going and so they start to attack her but that doesn't apply to the heist when they're in fisher's mind because fisher's already aware as soon as they get in there fisher's aware there's an there's an intrusion and his projections start attacking them right away so they should be able to just do whatever they like manipulate reality as much as they want because they're already being attacked right because he's trained like they have this other thing they explain where like if you're aware that you live in a world where people are stealing crap out of your dreams (laughs) right you can get out ahead of that by hiring these like security professionals who train you somehow (laughs) your subconscious they train no what you don't think that it's so that's not dumb it's dumb no i think it's great that's cool it's it's like if you thought of a concept like if you're like dude what if there's a movie where you steal ideas out of people's heads like you go into the dreams and steal crap you can go and just start writing a script but it's not as good or thought out or like fully formed as all the things that are formed in this movie like they really thought it through and i think if you really take this concept to nth degree you do arrive at things like try training <laughs> training okay. your subconscious yeah. to protect you know itself. what you're right my problem isn't that very concept uh there's a lot of other things that i think that are not well thought out but we'll get to that my problem is that they have worse aim than stormtroopers in this movie they're literally three feet oh away gosh. from them and they can't shoot them <laughs> yeah. they're like stationary together <laughs> less than three p- feet apart and they can't hit them yeah and it's yeah. so frustrating who did he pay to train this mental army like he needs to get his money back there's a specific part there's a specific part where they're in the the, the cab and they're that's when they initially get attacked and there is a guy standing in the rear. He's he's behind the car. He shoots out the rear windshield. There are two guys sitting in the in the back seat and he's like putting his gun in there and shooting and they're all fine. And then like they're there for like a minute and then the car backs up and he gets crushed. It's like what? He didn't shoot. He didn't get them. In like the whole minute of standing there like unloading into the car. It's pretty hard. Have you shot? <laughs> <laughs> have you tried shooting in have dreams tried? the only way that this is explained is that like there's some like fuzzy dream logic about like if you don't see yourself get shot or something i don't know you know i think i think that's what, what you have to kind of put the filter of the whole entire movie through is that there's dream logic and some of it yeah. just doesn't make sense and when you think about it too hard it starts to fall apart but we're going we're talking about the totems here right like yeah we why, were why is it that you can just 
you can okay you can spawn whatever so he spawn i guess he spawns the totem then right and so it gets to have whatever physics he wants it to have so like yeah it'll spin forever yeah it's like how did you design this totem so that it only spins forever in the dream well, you because you can't design it to spin forever in the real world. Well, no, no, no. I, I mean, like, how do you make it so that it d- spins forever in the? Well, if, it's he, a... if he can spawn wherever he wants, and he's like, my intention is that I spawn this totem that'll spin forever, uh, but, then it will. But yeah, what okay, if he doesn't enough. know he's in a dream? Does he have the ability to choose what he's spawning still? Like, that's the problem. Is the whole, the whole point is yeah, to know yeah, if yeah, he's yeah, dreaming yeah. or okay, not? Exactly. And this, this is a huge problem for me because, I mean, I don't know if we can keep talking about the totem, but like the 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 problem for me here is that if you are able to spawn whatever you want in the dream world, as soon as you can't spawn something in the real world, you should know that you're not dreaming, right? Well, unless you're the target. I don't know. No, if you, a, a, anyone in the dream world can manipulate the dream world. Ariadne was in uh, Cobb's dream when when they meet at the cafe in the in virtual Paris or whatever, and she's like. So Ari is the one that Cobb is going to hire to design is, the dream world. She's the architect. She's yeah, an architect. Played by Ellen Page. She's a student. Yeah. She's new to the crew. New to the crew, she's and the she one, immediately yeah. starts creating in the dream world. So it's like you don't even need training to do this. Well, she has some training. Like she's a she's a genius. I guess so. But she's mostly a character used to explain the all the concepts right, to the audience. Right. So like, if you can just like jump into a dream and immediately start creating stuff, uh, presumably, presumably, is that a word? Mal uh, and and Cobb spent fifty years in limbo creating. Mal is that a name? That's right. <laughs> Mal, Cobb's wife, um, uh, they spent 50 years creating in limbo. So like she woke up and the whole conceit is that she woke up and thought she was still dreaming. She was convinced of this idea that she was still dreaming. But wouldn't she have tried to create something at some point? Wouldn't she have tried to manipulate reality at some point and it doesn't work? But I guess the idea is that the inception kind of screwed up her mind so that she was insane afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I guess that would be the uh, workaround there. Like. Yeah, she's her brain's just toasted, dude. Yeah. She can't. <laughs> it's just toasted. <laughs> she doesn't know what's okay, going on. Okay, one more. Okay, I got a bunch I have of, a whole list of questions. I have a whole list of questions. Stuff. This is my. This is the best. Can I just say I love talking about plot holes. <laughs> it is the best. Probably too much. That's why the Terminator episode was but so this, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but this is. The, yeah. Okay. So one more thing about Maul. I forgot what I was gonna say. That's okay. Dang it. <laughs> Here's a random question. Um, so the the whole event like that culminates in this movie is that um, Maul kills herself. And it's because of the inception where where Cobb is like, hey, look, uh, this world is not real. So like we need to leave it. So she kills herself and they leave Limbo. But then in the real world, she thinks that's not real and she kills herself for real. And she does that in a hotel room. Okay, so Cobb goes down to his like memory bank. He goes down that ele- elevator into a memory bank. He walks in there. You see the disheveled hotel room. Yeah. He, go- he goes to the windowsill. He looks out the windowsill. And there's a ledge that he can eventually, he eventually does step on. There's like a, I don't know, eight foot gap. And then Maul's on this other ledge, which she apparently accessed from some other hotel room. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'm like, whose hotel room is that? Oh, well. How'd she get on that ledge? Okay. What that's, the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the part of the movie where you were like, wait a second. No, no I'm just saying this one <laughs> random like, huh? Like, I, did they have two I, hotel rooms for the random I street? figured. Oh, no. <laughs> a random Linus appears. Linus is rolling around. I haven't seen the movie. Okay. Inception? What? No! What are you talking about? Wait, Inception? Yeah, I saw Inception. Oh, yeah. thank God. I liked it. That was okay. scary. Linus just told us he didn't see the movie, and then we almost killed him, and then he said, yeah, he, okay, he did see it. <laughs> oh, my God. That would have been horrible. Because you, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Inception, this is probably one of the most complicated movies that like in Hollywood, as far as Hollywood movies go. Yeah. It's pretty complicated. If you haven't seen it, Classic Nolan. listen to the rest of this podcast, then go watch it, then yes. listen to this again. Yeah. As for the hotel room, I just assumed that it was a big, really big hotel room and it wrapped around. Or she climbed out on the ledge and then like shimmied around to that side okay, so he sure. couldn't get to her. They're balling, sure. Yeah. I've also heard it said that that's one of the hints that he's still in a layer of dreams. Uh, oh. I don't know. No. It's not. That's dumb. It's not unbelievable to think that she could get to the other side of that ledge. Okay, as, as long as we're still on plot holes, yeah, you know, we it. might as well finish the plot holes before we get on to like talking about the film. We could never finish the plot holes. Oh, Dave. Yes, dead. we can. Controversial. Okay. Um, dream time to real time. Seems pretty inconsistent. Super inconsistent. After the van starts going off the bridge. Well, for, hold on. First of all, we have to acknowledge that dream time 
to real time is inconsistent, even within the what they set up in the movie, because it depends on the sedative that you take. Right. So on, with some sedatives, you can be asleep for four hours and you get like 14 hours in the dream world. And the, other ones, oh, it's, it's more simple than that. It's one to 12 with the, the low power sedative yes. and one to 20 with the high power. That's sedative. Right. So you can mathematically calculate how deep we're going, how much time we're doing. And I've done it. Yeah, <laughs> trust me. I've got a spreadsheet here. I literally do. I did Google some of the, like the what the actual math is and stuff, like because they the the one benchmark that they actually say in the movie beyond the like one to twelve and one to twenty is like five minutes in the real world is an hour in in dream time, and then that's with the regular sedative. And then well, then but then details. there's uh, intentionally vague parts where they're like, guy on the level up, he's got a few minutes. We right. have about an hour, and so that's the that's the point I was gonna I, I was gonna bring up here. When th- so. In Dream Level One, Yusuf, the chemist, is driving the, the the van. He's getting chased by Fisher's projections. They corner him on a bridge, and then he decides, "All right, screw it. I'm gonna do the. We're gonna start the kick now." He goes and uh, gets everyone ready for the kick, and then backs the van off the bridge. So then, so the kick is uh, what you said. Eventually, wake people, everyone up. The kick is the sensation yes. of falling that wakes you up. Right. We can all relate to exactly. And the idea is that they're on these like three levels of dreams. The kick is going to bring them back up all three levels because there has to be three levels of kicks. Right, you're going to wake up from every dream level all at once. Yeah. So the van starts falling off the bridge. That's the first kick. Um, so they feel that happening in the bottom two levels, and they're like, "Okay, the van has ten seconds to to hit the water." Which is like a long time for a van to, like one thousand, two thousand, three. You probably got about four seconds, but whatever. <laughs> Let's say that he's so flying they say, off the edge. Sure, of the yeah, it's ten seconds in the in in dream one, three minutes in dream two, then because it's time twenty and it's like two hundred seconds, sixty minutes in dream three. And that's the only thing I really had to say about that was ten seconds is a long time for a van to drop. Well, it's not even that because the three minutes that he that <clears throat> Arthur has on level two. Which is the um, yes? That's the hotel. He does quite a lot. Of he that does time. a lot in three minutes. <laughs> There's a lot of scenes. He finishes of him floating fighting around. the guy, corrals all the <laughs> lassos all the people up, the the unconscious people together, places explosives on the elevator, puts them in the elevator. Like three minutes. Yeah, I know Joseph Gordon Levitt's a great guy, but like. That's even even for him. I feel like we should just like now that we're in the hotel, let's just talk about all the things in the hotel. Okay. That fight scene is one of the coolest fight it's scenes so ever. It's so sick. Oh, it's so awesome. Yeah. Okay. In the script, the screenplay, it's only like a paragraph. <laughs> it's there's one little uh, screen direction paragraph that's like, uh, the walls start <clears throat> rotating. Arthur is attacked by a subconscious, and that's it. And then it goes. Oh, wow. They had, on during production, it was two weeks of filming. They built this giant hallway that could rotate and then the actors so the, the camera's just on like a gimbal and the actor stays in the same spot as the room rotates yep. around there but because the uh the lighting all has to come from within that hallway because you see every side of that room that they're in so mm-hmm. all the sconces and the lights in that hallway are the practical lighting for that scene it's awesome dear viewer if you have not seen uh, like a behind the scenes featurette about the filming of this like look it up there, ba- there's some on youtube like, they basically just did uh, they pulled a 2001 space odyssey it was yeah Brilliant. it's so cool uh I, but I, I say this movie is just filled with those incredible set pieces i think the <clears> shot <throat> near the beginning when he's first getting kicked out of saito's mind and the water's gushing in from the sides is honestly one of the coolest shots in any nolan movie like in any recent movies ever it's such a cool shot yeah, it's kind of underrated it kind of just like goes by you yeah he's just standing there in a giant room and all this water's crashing in from the windows and like filling your room it's that sick. whole opening sequence i think is just like exquisite hold on i want to stay in the hotel though sure I, okay i have two questions for wait the that hotel. wasn't in the hotel i know that's not fair whatever <laughs> <laughs> okay in the hotel the shot where um, he's wrapping all those bodies up like so that they can move as one projectile unit and get kicked when they hit the wall or whatever. Yep. You know what I'm talking about? Like they're all floating. Basically, the people are lying like planks and he stacks them into like a set of six or something like that, like right. a neat little brick. And then he like rotates them all as one unit as he's like tying them up with rope. How the hell did they shoot that? Was that just VFX people or like, yeah, what I was, was kind of confused for the whole because there's the there's the bit where the the hallway's rotating and like we know how we did that, but then later they're fighting in basically zero gravity. Yeah, and like while all the thing is rotating. Yeah, what it's because and I'm just like, wait, if they're using wires, there were a couple parts where I was like, how does that work with wires? Did they did they put it in a in a plane and like do the free fall thing? I don't know how they did it, but oh, I did notice should, I a completely. That up. Do you remember? Um, 
he fights a, a couple guys when it's rotating, but then later on when it's zero G, he just fights one guy one on one. Yeah. Like the guy's just hiding behind a credenza or some crap yeah. like the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Surprise! And then he just fights this one guy. And I don't blame Nolan because it's like an opportunity to make another cool side, uh, fight scene in even different uh, physics. Yeah. But did you do you remember how that fight ends? Uh, he chokes the yeah. guy out, right? Oh, well, there's that one. Yeah, he chokes the guy out. He does this thing. Uh, I noticed, I was watching it because I have new jujitsu eyes since I've been doing jujitsu <laughs> since like March. And so he does this thing called gift wrapping, which is uh, when you take like the, the guy is getting choked, his own arm is going across his right. neck. And then he chokes him out with your own arm. Betrayed so, by your own limbs. Exactly. So I, I looked at this choke and I was looking at him like, what the heck? There's no way the way that his arms are positioned, one of his carotids is like completely exposed. And I was like, is this even a move? And I was like researching it and crap, and there's like whole forum posts of <laughs> other jujitsu nerds <laughs> complaining like, about this particular. Everybody just saw the movie. Like this movie was so <laughs> sick, but like, did you see that choke? Yeah, <laughs> Inception, <laughs> worst movie ever. Apparently, it's a choke called a needle and thread choke. Totally, which is the same thing. Like, so if I was mounted on Riley on the ground, oh, right, I don't want. I would put my arm behind the back of your head, uh huh, and I'd gift wrap you. Your front arm is grabbing mine. Yeah, but the difference is when I when we do that on the mat. Typical Thursday. I get to choke you with the force on the of the mat, like the mat's behind you. Oh. So I can press your arm, like. But in zero G. There was nothing to press against. Oh. So Newton's third law violated. He can't <laughs> tighten that choke. <laughs> There's no nothing to press. That's against. the main problem with Inception. They violated Newton's third law in this scene with the choke. Everything else is fine. <laughs> Apparently, Gordon Levitt did like a couple of weeks of jujitsu, like in prep for that. Oh, really? Which is. Oh, so right. it is a jujitsu move. It's a real choke. Oh, so that's There's yeah. There's okay. no way it could be done. That's valid. No val way. like vertical like that. Oh my gosh. Okay, one more. You know what? I got a couple more plot holes. We're gonna we go have through. to go through all of them. Yeah. There's so many. Okay, real quick, real quick, real quick. Cobb could have gone back into Mal's subconscious and gotten rid of the idea that reality isn't real. Oh, okay. Like while she's still alive, he so incepted her. He could have extracted it. Yeah. No, but when you do an extraction, you don't remove that idea from someone's head. You just like also learn it. It's it's a copy rather than a cut. Oh, you're so right. It's a copy paste. Well, because I was thinking like when he did an, an Inception, he went into like her childhood home in limbo and like went into the safe and put the top there and then left it. So I was like, just go back and get the top out. She put the top there. What are you she, talking about? She puts the top it's there. It's her totem. Yeah, yeah. It's She didn't put the top yeah, there. Yeah, she did. She, what are you talking about? The scene is you hear the voiceover of Cobb saying she <clears throat> she deliberately wanted to forget this thing. She had a secret and she didn't want to know. So she has her totem, which tells her that where they are is fake. By It's spinning forever. She takes that and she bears it deeper inside herself in her childhood home in a safe, which is a sick image, by the way. Like wait, 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 this wait. idea in a safe. She puts it in no. there. Cobb later goes to that safe, opens it, spins it, <gasps> then closes the door and leaves. Am I right, David? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I still think that's stupid, though. I still think that's stupid because she buried it there so she'd never look at it. Cobb's whole plan of Inception relies on her going back to that safe, opening it up for some reason to find this thing that she intentionally buried. No, no, no. And then seeing it spinning. No, that's not how that works. What? That's her subconscious. So it just like affects her automatically. She doesn't have to go back to the safe and see it. What do you think? Uh, yeah. What do you think, David? Uh, I stopped thinking about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's too dumb. The safe what in her childhood home. No, the, the safe in her childhood home represents her subconscious. So he went okay. and changed something in her subconscious. So that affects the way oh, that she behaves. But they're in limbo, though. They're not in her. Well, limbo her, is subconscious. Lim limbo yeah, yeah. is raw, raw subconscious. infinite subconscious. Okay, I can get behind what you're saying. Okay. I can see that one. Here's something that was dumb in the skiing scenes. <laughs> is this, this whole podcast is just going to be talking about how dumb it is. I haven't even gotten started. Yeah. There, anyway, this is just a dumb one. You have like, a lot to say. Okay, real quick. Make it quick, James. It's super quick. Ed Hardy's skiing. He's getting chased by two other skiers who want to kill him. They all go off like a drop or a, a jump. Yeah. Ed Hardy lands. The third skier lands and continues chasing, but the second middle skier goes off that jump, he just doesn't land it. He just goes, <laughs> and he just folds, and it's like, got well, him. <laughs> that henchman's dispensed with, he's just gone. <laughs> That's all it took. He's the worst projection. Oh, yeah, he's later the in projection. That, later yeah. in that scene, he's fighting someone in the base, and the guy throws him over the ledge of a thing, which drops him about a foot <laughs> onto the snow. Super dangerous. And he his gun's over there. And then this, the guy just, the henchman jumps over the ledge, lands in the snow, and, and Tom Hardy's picked yeah. up his gun. And it's one of the silliest yeah, that's scenes one of the I've si ever seen. I like that one, actually. The only oh, way like that, that makes one. sense is because they're fighting, and then the, the gun accidentally gets knocked off. 
But then they're fighting, 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 and then Tom Hardy gets knocked off. The gun happens to be there. But then the guy doesn't realize the gun's down there, so he jumps and then he gets shot. Yeah, he's that henchman just sucks. I think the projections in general are just like stupid. They're not yeah, smart. They're just not good. Yeah. And and he dropped more than a foot. I think he dropped like seven feet, I would say. Okay. Fisher got shot twice in the chest. Okay. Then went down to limbo. Then when you kill yourself in limbo, you just show up in dream three again and you're fine. Oh, not 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 for Saito. That's different. Different inconsistent rules for yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Saito has to go get rescued, but I guess si- because Saito went to limbo and he forgot that who he was. He forgot he was dreaming. So I have the mathematical formula for how much time is possible for Saito to have spent in limbo. It is about two years. If it took ten minutes for Leo to die, which is the absolute most your brain takes to die from drowning, it would be about 555 days that Saito would be in there, and in that time he's turned into an old man. And so that math. Does not check out, and this movie is garbage. Wait, what do you mean? So time goes at a factor of 8,001 from Limbo to Dream Level 1. 8,000? 8,001. So it's 2,400, 8,000, 160,000 based on reality. But when you divide by 20, that's 8,000. So... <laughs> I didn't want to go into the math of this. I have lost Trust it. me. Wait, I've you're, lost you're, you. This is based on the fact that they say that when you get into level three, they would have 10 years. Is that what they say? No, it's all based on like the, the 20, the factor of okay. 20. Okay. Each okay. level is going down 20. Real simplify this. Based on your calculations, the max amount of time anyone could be in limbo? No, the max amount of time that it would take for Leo to appear in limbo based on when he dies and now descends into limbo, yes. is 555 okay. days. That's what I was That's going to say. That's if it took 10 minutes to drown and become brain dead, which is way longer than it normally takes. Yeah. Saito would maybe not Saito was already old. super old. Like, you know that stereotype how <laughs> Asians look so, so young for so long, and then they just, like, turn into Kim Jong-il. Gosh, like, you're instantly? right. Could maybe be. that happened to Saito. <laughs> okay. He's only, like, a year older. Yeah. Those are the end of my plot holes. Now That's can we it? talk about the movie? <laughs> but I have so many. Oh, do you? I have so many more. Okay, go. Oh, yeah, so the opening, they're breaking into Saito's mind, and he's auditioning them to see if they're good. They fail, but he's so impressed that they had a dream within a dream. That's yeah. what convinces him. But later in the movie, when they're recruiting the uh, the pharmacist, he's he mentions, like, oh, dreams within a dream? No problem. We've done that hundreds of times. So it is not a big deal in this universe to do a dream within a dream. Well, you and for Saito that. to be well, so impressed no, is silly. That, that just means Saito didn't know about it. The yeah. other guy is like, does this for a living. Saito didn't know. But Yusuf is like a chemist. Like he but does. He's like. He's one of the most powerful men in the whole world who's found out about Inception. You don't think he would have access to this information of like that it's pretty normal to do dreams within a dream? Well, what? I would I would guess that maybe he has like been in dreams before, but he hasn't been in a dream within a dream. So maybe it was like, whoa. Plus, Yusef's a badass because Eames knows him, and Eames is in that locale, and Eames is like, oh, if you need a chemist, there's a good chemist here, and yeah. then they go to that den, which is one of the coolest and most sci-fi parts of this movie. I thought when they go into that, they yeah. they open the door, and there's like twelve or fourteen people all connected to one sharing dream, and then the the attendant there working is like, no, they they come here to wake up. Their normal lives are the crappiest parts of their experience. And then they come here, and each day that they come here, they spend 40 hours of yeah. dream time here. There is and like, that's their real life. That's so cool. much potential with like a world like that. And honestly, I like the movie, but if there's one like huge disappointment for me, it's that they didn't like explore more like this. Totally. Or like or that there wasn't like a sequel or honestly, like Christopher. I, okay, hold- this was an original screenplay. I hope there's never, ever a sequel. I know, I never. know, I know. But the world is just so cool. Like, I spent a bit of time on the Inception wiki preparing for this podcast. And, like, there's a wiki. Like, there, I could imagine so many more stories that could be tell, told in a world where dream sharing is a thing. Especially since, like, <clears throat> Maul and and uh, Cobb go into their own limbo for equivalent of 50 years. And then she starts to go insane. Well, no shit, dude. You went in there with two people. That would get so boring. Oh These gosh, guys yeah. are in a dream with fourteen people. Yeah, like you could if you did a shared dream with like I don't know a decent number of people and everybody. It'd be like you know what it's like. It's like playing Grand Theft Auto online. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> it's just right. Chaos. Exactly. Everybody is doing so much exactly. wacky chaos. Yeah. But and limbo. You accidentally get set into limbo. Oh, whoops! All you have to do to exit limbo is kill yourself. No, unless you forget this limbo. So that's the danger that you forget that you're in limbo. I guess. But you're creating stuff the whole time. Yeah, it's dumb. That's what doesn't make any sense. But this I guess you create something dumb. and then you forget that you created yeah. it. Or I think that like they knew that that was a plot hole. And that maybe that's why they tried to avoid at all costs you just randomly spawning stuff and cr- doing creative stuff. Right, right. Because like, 
they could have done secret stuff. Like, let's say they're holed up in a building and someone's militarized consciousness is descending upon them. Uh, but if you do anything wacky, you're just going to alert that consciousness even more mm. and the person might wake up. Okay, well, if you're hidden uh, inside of a building already, then right. why not just make like a little escape hatch and then you like go down, you just close it and you're in a bunker. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, a deus exactly. ex machina, which is why they didn't do it. Right. It just, it breaks the movie because you can just do whatever you there want. There are cool. so many, I mean, yeah, I hate having to say that like you have to turn your brain off for, especially for a movie that like is this rich with world building. But it's, you kind of definitely do. turn your brain off. Yeah, if but you, you can't. Compl- it- you can't turn it off because there's a really cerebral movie that requires you to keep up. I don't think it's that complicated. They go in a dream to get another dream to get another dream to incept this idea. It's pretty simple. It's just a heist film in reverse where they're planting something instead of taking it out. You're like, just a genius, huh, David? It's no, not simple. it's not that complicated. What's complicated about it? You can go into dreams. Uh, the dreamer has to be. The dreamer builds the world and can be the only one who has knowledge That's of it. That's pretty complicated. You don't part, need to know that. there's another dreamer there. That's not that important. Well, it's not that important, All but these details important. matter, though. The not fa- really. The fact that Limbo is like a shared dream space, but it's populated <clears throat> by w- the creations of whoever in that group was the only, like, had been there before. And in this case, that's Cobb. There's all these details throughout the whole movie. That right. don't matter, though. Like, it doesn't change, like, the plot. Well, it kind of matters. Plot. It's it, a heist. It, it you matters. son of a bitch, I'm in. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> what it is. It's like a simple heist movie with a really cool shell. And the shell's incredible. But it's not that complicated. It's not that smart. It's well, like it matters a if, cool idea. It matters if you care about who these projections are and where they're coming from and who's why. Wait, why are they being attacked? Why are they chased by these people? Like, because th- that matters because those are Fisher's projections, but they're not in Fisher's mind. But they are going into Fisher's subconscious to get to his mind so they can implant an idea. But they're not in his mind. Like it, it, it doesn't make there. It makes you sense when you, when you peel back the layers. All, but they're, in there every are layers. layer, they're bringing him. And in the end, he just has to have this <clears throat> fake encounter with his dad and have this moment where he's like, my dad did love me. That, that's what this oh. movie boils down to. It doesn't have... You keep explaining in those convoluted ways. He They just bring him down three dream levels, fake this encounter, and then bring him back. It's not that complicated. They make him think that they're in his mind. Yeah, that's what's like kind of complicated is that it's a heist movie. You have to like have all these reveals. All these like, ooh, we're one layer deep. Oh, no, we're not. We're actually deeper. Man, going to Mars is not that complicated. You get in a ship. You have a lot of propellant in the ship. You blast off and you land it on Mars. I like this. But it's pretty damn tough to do, isn't it? <laughs> there's always You can make Caught. everything sound simple, but there's <laughs> lots of details. I don't okay, know. Here's something I think the movie's good at, and I think David will agree with me. Just from a movie perspective. Oh masterful information flow the mm. way that they unpeel the story you always have these questions oh wow like when the I first agree but continue no man it's awesome continue. i actually agree with it's this awesome one. the first time that um, they go into a dream world when Cobb is explaining it to the new architect girl ari ari ariadne um she gets the dream ends when maul who you don't even know yet comes up and stabs her yeah right and and ari only knows that that's someone from his subconscious so when they get out of the dream she goes Nice subconscious you got there, Cobb. Yeah. And then Arthur says, oh, so you met Mrs. Cobb. So now you know, like, oh, there's this particular person. Like, people in your subconscious can be, like, actual characters. And he has a wife. And then the next time that she's mentioned, Ari's, like, uh, uh, says something like, oh, his ex-wife. And then Arthur's like, no, that's his real wife. She's dead. And it's just like, okay, now she's dead. So they give you more information, but it just begs more questions. Yeah, yeah. And, like, it just gets deeper and deeper. And then there's even... Hold on. They do okay. it. They just do it in such small ways. Like when Ari is going down the elevator into the his memory basement, she passes this one floor that the elevator doesn't mm. stop at. And on that floor, there's a train rushing by. Right. And you're like, what's that? There's just all these little things like injected yeah. throughout. That's awesome. No, I, I, I completely... Sorry. You want to go? No, I just want to... Do they ever explain that train? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The train is how they kill themselves and leave limbo. They oh, put their heads yeah. on the train. The train is like a recurring I remember that motif. Image. I remember that image. And the yeah. train also the train comes in on up. level one yep. and, and crashes in. And everyone's like, why is there a train here? Okay, kind it's of a on, train of thought. Oh, uh, God. Oh, kind God. of on that topic, <laughs> why do they let Leo come into these dreams? That is so dumb. He's so unstable. <laughs> it's absolutely idiotic that they accept that he joins them. They, <laughs> no, he, but they that's should part, not that's the let him be in these dreams. No, but he, he every it. time, every time his wife is going to show up and kill someone. Yeah, just let him help plan. Let him help come with ideas. <laughs> let him help recruit, and then shut him the fuck out of these dreams. Okay, David, you should he, have tested your audio levels with that kind of passion. <laughs> I knew you were going to do this, and you didn't let Jake know ahead of time. Because no, he's that part. skilled. That's the that's the tension. Is that he's the best extract 
factor in he's the not game. That good though, like, what do we see him do that he's so good he's at? He's so good, thing. dude. But dude, that's he not even, the whole thing. Exactly. But that's not even the whole he, thing. He catches the bullet casings as they come out of his silenced gun. Yeah, that was badass. Yeah, was... he's okay. the best. But not even that. <laughs> not only is he the best, but he's also not telling the other people how unstable he is. Which is that's Ari's whole, Ari's whole character is how is about man. How are you not telling people? They need to know what they're getting into. Right. I mean, Joseph Gordon Levitt. He knows. He knows. He knows because when she wakes up. He knows that she was killed by by Ma. Mm. And so I don't think it's as hidden as the movie kind of wants us to think. Well, Eames doesn't know. That's a Tom Hardy's character. Sato doesn't know. Saito. You, okay, Saito. And Yusef doesn't <laughs> but, know. But I mean, two people that are like pretty smart people, they should they should know. And like, I don't know. I that I found that very frustrating in this movie that they're letting him into the dream. I feel like I feel like it adds to the character though that he's like What character? Uh, Cobb's character. There's not much character. It, I mean? I agree, but but the character that is there is that of a troubled person who like only cares about one thing, getting back to his his family. Mm-hmm. So he's he doesn't care who gets taken along on the ride with him, except Saito. Maybe he goes back because Saito is the guy who can who can do get him back who, to who his can kids. clear his but, name. But he doesn't he doesn't care about the collateral damage, like right. Like, he's yeah. a damaged guy. That is half half of the <clears throat> plot of the movie is his character. The one half is the outward journey where they're like, we need to put this idea in Fisher's head. The other half of the plot is like, this guy has this grief that he hasn't dealt with and it is it is being made apparent in his working life. And like, we can all deal with that. I, I, I do agree with David a little bit that the character is, is kind of weak because he's pretty one note. He's always like, Listen, I'm intense and I'm explaining something to you very clearly. You have to do it this way or that's the way it is. Oh no, I'm troubled by my wife. Listen. <laughs> Back to explaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the movie's so complicated it almost it kind of requires that to an extent. I had a thought that because this movie is such about is such a heightened reality and these characters are so grounded, they all kind of feel the same to me. Like tell me if you guys can answer this. Without talking about what they do or their appearance, tell me like unique characteristics of like Leo, Joseph Gordon Levitt, sure. Ellen Page, Ken Watanabe. Arthur is pragmatic, right? He always just wants to get the job done. Mm. He's like, that's very cool, Eames. Does it buy us more time? Like, can we do this? And Eames is all Eames is a bit artistic. more flash. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a great banter together. You, you must and then be Ari, afraid to dream of little Wait, Eames, Eames is Tom, I didn't include Tom Hardy because he's one of the ones that actually has character. Oh, okay. Oh, that guy's Take him so out. awesome. Take him out. Ariadne doesn't have much character. Yeah, she does. She does like really bold shit that I was like rude. Cobb is just like having his own dream there, hooked up to the thing himself. And she just like walks up <clears throat> and hooks herself up and joins him in his dream. Pretty audacious. I don't think that's that much about her character and more about convenience for the movie. Yeah. I didn't get the sense that it's like a character choice. That's no. a plot choice. They need, well, it is a, they need Miss true. Exposition to go into his dream to give us more exposition. Plot, no, Does but not... the re- she has a reason to do it. Her character reason for doing it is that she doesn't know if she should be even involved in this kind of in this outfit because this guy's so unstable. Yeah, but that's... So she needs to know what she and the others are getting into. I don't think that's something that she necessarily she would do and not another character would do. Like you, Riley, you would never do that. If I'm sitting there dreaming, you would Maybe. never be like, hmm, I'm going to hook myself know. up. I've, I was... sn- I've snuck around eavesdropping a little bit in my life. Like, you wouldn't even sit at I'm my desk a... and like... I'm not all goody two-shoes. You wouldn't even sit at my desk and like roll through my uh, team's chats. Yeah, but do you, do you think that... I would definitely do that. His eyes are shifty. I would definitely do that. <laughs> I'm telling you right this now. This is way more intimate than that. Like, you don't know what's going on in that dream. And then she gets there and it's <laughs> and it's him like <clears throat> talking to his, his dead wife. It's like pretty intense. And then what does she do from there? She like while he gets like on this little expedition train with like explaining something, she just sneaks off, okay, goes okay. back and Dis- hits the basement but, to go to the most intense memory but, he has. But see, all these things are like action or plot focus. They're not character yeah. decisions. And I think that's the problem. It's like we haven't gotten to know these people, and it's not like based on like who this person is. It's based on like what the action that has to happen is. Right. And we yeah, know okay. so we like we know that Cobb is haunted by his wife's death or like his role in her death. But like, what is he like outside of this? tense situation right like we know i can envision what eames would be like because he's a he's a more gambling exactly he's a more well fleshed out fleshed out character but i feel like a bunch of the characters in this movie suffer from not having distinct characterizations that Mm -hmm. allow you to you know get get, gain a grasp of what they would act like in a given situation here's another stupid thing there's a car chase where the motorcycle is chasing a van and then the van slams on its brakes which means that the motorcycle goes screeching past it and gets keyboned by a car. Newsflash, bikes can stop way faster than vans. <laughs> that would not happen. Al- also, when that van gets flipped, I'm pretty sure that's like enough of a kick based on what we've seen previously in that movie. I thought that took me out of it a little bit. When the van gets flipped over and over and over, 
that should give you enough of a kick to wake them it's up. It's a powerful sedative, David. <laughs> it's a powerful sedative. Here's another stupid thing. When they're in the plane and and they're actually just making Fisher get passed out just to kick off the whole mission, Cobb is sitting behind him, right? And he's like, hey, yeah, sorry for your loss. And and then the stewardess comes by and offers them drinks. And Cobb has like this sedative in his hand and he like puts it into the drink. That, oh, and yeah, that's yeah. what knocks out Fisher initially. They already are buying out the yeah, whole right. the the stewardess. Why don't they just get the stewardess, the stewardess? made the drinks, is on your payroll. <laughs> she should be putting the sedative in it. It doesn't make any sense. Man. But okay, it's better. It's a better visual. Christopher <laughs> Nolan really screwed up the director, that is. Do you know what annoys me? When you know the scene where Ariadne has to draw ma- mazes to Cobb to prove that she's got enough of imagination to fill it out? The maze that finally impresses him enough is impossible. It's not a real maze. It can't be solved. Are you paused it? Yes. If you freeze frame, it's like two moves, you're done. And I think that's a lazy, lazy, lazy thing. Uh. And I think the, like to me that's there's other the things. The one in this that she draws that on, that. like the yeah, the, the circle one. That's pretty lazy. It's like the it's a, can't be solved in about huh. two moves. You oh. mean if you, no matter where you start, you yeah, always or, so you're supposed to start at the center, and then it's yeah, it's just blocked. You know, the more we talk about these plot holes that like I was looking for, the more I'm like, ah, oh, they don't really matter, guys. It's true. And they don't. It's such an incredible we movie. We should we should really like put a caveat on all this like complaining <laughs> about plot holes and say that like I really enjoyed this movie and it remains one of my favorite. Man, one I my watched it twice this favorite. weekend. Yeah. I gave oh, it a God. nine. These don't matter. The VFX were so sick, and because Christopher Nolan never really uses it, like he does practical as much as he can, he shoots on film, they still hold up. Yeah, it like looks yeah. scene when they're sitting there and all that uh, stuff is exploding around them, all yeah. like those, the market. See, I love funnily the world enough, stuff flipping over, yeah. Funnily enough, like, yeah, was, wait, that wasn't practical. It's it's mixed. Oh, okay. It's mixed. They had uh, explosions go off that were shooting paper and everything right, around, right, and right. then they add in more particle okay. effects. Okay. There's only one effect that in the whole movie I'm like, ugh. That looks pretty bad, actually. Oh, what's that? It's when she bends Paris over on top of itself, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then they walk to like the edge. Oh, of it, and then yeah. They, start, they yeah. step yeah. on the transition it. where they step onto the other plane. It's pretty bad. Yeah, that <laughs> looks pretty bad. Looks yeah. Pretty bad. Funnily enough, um, <clears throat> I know that Christopher Nolan is like really good at at uh, incorporating a lot of practical effects and like getting kind of fantastical concepts across while still seeming realistic. But like this movie is definitely one where I wish that there was a bit more, I don't know, CGI, where, like, I wanted to see people manifest more grenade launchers out of nowhere, you know? Like, I wanted to see that. And I and I do appreciate the kind of Looney Tunes nature of it, where somebody can just, like, put their hand off screen and pull in something, like, with uh, where... <laughs> yeah. what, that's how Eames brings up the grenade launcher, basically. But, like, I wanted to see more examples of that. And uh, I was a bit disappointed. I think along that lines, I wish this movie was actually more surreal. There was more like things that you like don't make sense, like that, that are kind of not mentioned. They talk about like the paradoxal staircase. I don't like that. And that, that. but I wish there was like more the like, like you, they think they're going somewhere, but they've trapped them in. But like you, right. you as an audience are like not sure what's going on. Yes. I think they could have done a more like, like elevated surrealism. And this movie's very low level surrealism. Yeah. It's yeah. very simple. And it's surrealism. It explains it all. It gives you the answers. Yeah. And there's no questions by the end if of it. If they had had some kind of fight or conflict in limbo where it didn't matter about someone waking up because you're not really in the dream space anymore, mm. then they could have done at least one scene where they're doing something. Well, I don't want like a like Doctor that. Strange fight where they can like raise buildings and turn them into like yeah. clocks or something stupid. I want like more questioning reality. There was very little actually questioning reality in this movie. It's very linear in how it's progressing. And it's very linear in it's logic f- from dream to dream. It's not like the further you go into dreams, the less thing makes sense. It's 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 a movie that's trying to make sense of what's happening. Mm. So I okay, the paradox stairs. They're kind of cool. When I saw it originally, I was probably like, "That's sick." But when I'm watching it now, I'm like, "It's kind of cheesy." He's like, "Paradox," and then they yeah, like, the way, that's the way the guy the, over the ledge. Joseph Gordon See, Levitt. That's just... I totally agree. I think that the like moment of payoff at the end is really cheesy. But I think if they do more things like that without telling about it, and that's something you get to enjoy on rewatches. I think that'd be really cool. Where like you're like, oh, that space doesn't make sense. They walk through this building, turn to the left, go up, but then all of a sudden, like they're underneath where they once were, and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. And like this movie doesn't have that. But it how does have... that work? Because how do those uh, what are they called? Pan- Pandozi steps, Penrose, Penrose stairs. steps uh, from those um, uh, yeah, Etcher kind of drawing. Yeah, those paradox stairs. How do they work in the dream world? Because th- it's an optical illusion when it's on paper. Yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, I th- so I was does that mean that. that like Joseph Gordon-Levitt character <laughs> Arthur has to like manifest them to suddenly there's a gap that I can push you off? Well, or how does it work? The idea is that 
you experience them as if they're, it's an infinite staircase. Until someone else until, doesn't want you until to. Until you're like, oh, look, it's not. I guess he had to change it in that moment. Like, I was thinking about that watching that where, okay, from their perspective, they're probably just like walking up and up and up and up and up. And they don't really notice that they're actually like going down a level when they are or whatever. But I, I don't know. Because when, sh- when he shows the Penrose steps to Ari, it's in Arthur's dream. So he has control of being like, they walk around one loop and then on the second loop, they're on a precipice. And he's like, whoa. Right. He has control over that. Right. When he kills a guy using that in level two, that's Arthur's dream again, is it not? No, that is. It, it well, is. Well, it's Ariadne's structure because yeah, Ariadne yeah, designed but, the level. But and, Arthur's dreaming and Ari, and Ari showed him the. She, yeah. She informs he, so, him of how so, But he didn't, he didn't manifest that. He just knew it was there. So it, he used it. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah. It's, still, it's still up to him, I think, to like uh, decide if it's a closed loop or if it's an open loop. I, it must be. I don't know. I don't know how that works. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, it's one of those things where they're like, I think there's a few different things in this movie where something exists in pop culture and they're like, we have to work that into the movie. Like a yeah. dream within a dream is one example. Falling and waking up is another example. Right. And, and then the Penrose step is another thing. Paradox. Paradox. I want to go back to something that you said real quick about the exposition. You thought that the, the movie in general showed rather than told more. Well, there's lots of telling. I'm, my main complaint with this movie, watching it, you know, for the fourth time or whatever, I didn't realize this the the, the previous time that I watched it. The whole intro scene where they're, you know, the audition with Saito, that whole scene is just showing, not telling, which is great. And then after that scene, it basically switches to like plain telling from there on until the actual mission starts. It's just like, this is how it works. There are dreams. It was a military program. Uh, there's a chemical called subnasin, and it puts you, some, some I don't know how you say it. Uh, well, it puts you under for this long, and the dream time is this long, blah, blah, blah. Because at the beginning of the movie, they want to discombobulate, and it's like a hook. You're yeah, like, what yeah. is happening? I have all these questions, and I have to keep watching. I wish, yes, fair enough, but like, I wish that they could have continued on with the showing bit and like sprinkled in tidbits of information instead of just like, this is how it works. Some of the exposition is uh, is within drama. Like, so for example, at the midpoint of the movie, at this point, you think you know what's going on. Because in most storytelling, if if they tell you the plan, like if there's a heist movie that we're like, here's our plan. We're going to do this, this, and this. And the yeah. audience hears it. Then odds are that, pl- that it doesn't go to plan. They fail. No, for sure. And if there's a movie where it's like, okay, here's our plan. Then they might show you the plan, act out. Right. In this movie, they tell you the plan. We're going to go to level one and we're going to like, plant the idea for Fisher. And then a level two is going to be his own idea. And they tell you what they're going to do. And then you still get to see the plan kind of go to plan. Sort of. It goes but, to hell first level and they change it. Yeah. But what they do is at the midpoint of the movie, when you think you know what's going to happen, that's when you figure out there's this concept of limbo. And I didn't tell you guys, but if you die, you go to limbo. Yeah, and that's a, that's and a great moment. And at that point, you're all in. No, for and, sure. And when they were, they're having the conversation about that, it's a yelling match. Yeah, and that, and that is what I, I wanted what more of for? that. I wanted more of that, where it's like we learn these things through dramatic means. And I think maybe part of the reason I was upset, <laughs> I'm so upset, I was just crying watching the movie, uh, with this is because it's a heist movie, and heist movies already have a planning section where you learn about everything. Okay, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then he's going to show up, and blah, blah, blah. And there's a whole plan, and then they do the execution phase. And in this one, you have the planning phase, that is mixed in with the exposition phase where you have to learn about all this dream world and how it works and blah, blah, blah. So maybe it was just like too much planning, too much exposition uh, exposition stuffed into one part of the movie. I would have liked to see it spread out a little bit. But. Here's something that doesn't make any sense. They're all in Paris, right? Yeah. He's not allowed in the US. The school that Ari goes to is in Paris. The professor at that school who makes the connection is Cobb's father-in-law. He's a professor at this college in Paris. It's Michael Caine. Is it <laughs> Michael Caine? <laughs> okay. Yeah. In the end of the movie, Michael Caine. Cobb's name is. Please keep doing that. <laughs> Cobb's <laughs> name is cleared. He's allowed to return to America. He returns to America. He goes into his house where his children are, and Michael Caine is there. Michael Caine picks him up in the airport yeah. in America. Yeah. So it's like, what's the deal? These kids live in America where Cobb can't go. Yeah. The kids are being cared for by. Their grandma, the yes. mother of Maul, who's dead. So grandma lives in America with the kids. Grandpa lives in Paris teaching. 
until Cobb can go back, and then he's in America, and he picks him up from the airport and brings. <gasps> what him a to dick America. move! Oh Just gosh. all move to Paris. That proves it's wow, a they dream. Suck. I, what the heck? That proves it's a dream. It's not real. No, it just proves his family is the worst. Michael Caine's supposed to be in Paris. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Is this is that it, guys? Is there more? Mr. DiCaprio, welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's another thing about the dream th- at the end. The kids say, Daddy, we're building a castle on the cliff. Come look. What the heck? What? They're, they're creating these fantastical things. Are they in a dream? It, the, the camera pans over. It's like a huge castle. The kids are just standing on the lawn. There's, he just doesn't they're not even, even care. in a sandbox. They're just on grass. So what the hell are they talking what about? What cliff? What castle? Mall? Is that you? Whatever. Boom! Gunshot. That's how the end movie should have ended. That's how the sequel starts. <laughs> That's how the sequel starts, baby. Inception 2. Dream harder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I I'm gonna end it. I'm gonna call it. Guys. Yeah, that's about enough of yeah. that. Are you happy, David? Not, not that I had to watch this movie. Oh, what? You just <laughs> wait. What did you give it? Seven point nine. Seven point nine. David, it's fine. I give it an eight. This movie is incredible, but it's just fluff. It's got nothing to say. It's not that intelligent. Like it's really Whoa. simple. Whoa! And I want to end on that. I want to make. I want to make talk about that. Just... Yeah, we did. There's substance. <laughs> okay, substance abuse. Guilt. Oh. Blame. Phaetons. Okay. I, the power of much, memory. Do you know much the about... Power, the power of uh, getting stuck in the past and not moving forward. The power of like not resolving yeah. your uh, emotional conflicts. Yeah. It doesn't really do a good job exploring that. That's fair. It's, I just give up. <laughs> the action's not great. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you like the action? Yeah. The, like, the set pieces are the best part about <laughs> this, this movie. Best, this is the best ending oh to a podcast God. we've ever had. <laughs> Guys... <laughs> The next episode is going to be Inception Redux. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Well, thank you for listening. Follow us on the Twitter that isn't uh, set up yet. Or follow us on our personal ones. The power of subjective reality. What's real? Is this real? Are we brains in a vat? The ending of this podcast is real. <laughs>